Good morning. Thank you for coming to this Caribbean semester presentation. Uh, those of you in Corley Auditorium and those of you watching by Zoom, we appreciate your attendance. It's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker this morning, Michael Wood. He earned his undergraduate degrees in finance and history, as well as a master's degree in history from the University of Alabama. And then he went on to Texas Christian University, TCU, for his PhD studies. Fate brought him back to the University of Alabama, where he teaches sports studies courses as an instructor in the Department of American Studies. His research deals primarily with international cultural encounters between the United States and Latin America. Currently, his work focuses on American football games played between teams from the U.S. South and Havana during the first half of the 20th century. And I know that he's hoping to turn his research into a book. He has traveled to Cuba four times to conduct his research, including once as an undergraduate. This is the second of three presentations he's giving today. Next hour at noon, he will be speaking on U.S.-Cuba relations. So please join me in welcoming Michael Wood to Missouri Southern. All right, thank you, Chad. Uh, I want to. I did this in the first uh, our, our first hour together, but I, I'll, I'll do it again. Um, it bears repeating. I, I want to thank Chad. I want to thank Missouri Southern for inviting me here, uh, giving me an opportunity to speak with you and share some uh, some of my research um, at this time. And I want to thank Brian uh, for helping out with the uh, the accommodations, uh, making sure. Uh, the flights were booked in the hotels. Everything worked perfect. I want to thank them for that. And um, all right, How, how's the audio? Is everything good? All right, let's let's get going. Thank you all for for attending. Uh, thank you for, for those in attendance in person and and on Zoom. I think I think that got got through all of the uh, the thank yous. Um, all right. So when approaching this topic. This is an enormous topic, and it's it's a little bit overwhelming when I when I started to pull my thoughts together uh, to to make a presentation uh, for you today. Um, I I even toyed with the idea of uh, posing some rhetorical questions like you know, when when you think of Cuba, what do you think of those sorts of things, and you know, kind of bring in this idea of of baseball. I'm going to operate under the assumption that. When you, when you think of Cuba, you think of Cuban baseball along with the music and dance and food and that sort of culture. Uh, that, that baseball is, is intimately tied to Cuban culture generally. Okay, so I'm, I'm operating under that assumption. Now, I, I frame this as uh, Cuban national pastime. Uh, baseball is also considered the United States, you know, the American pastime. Uh, and how did two, two countries who, for the better part of 50 to 60 years, have been adversaries, uh, how do they share a national pastime? And we're going to look at the Cuban side of things with this. And so I, I'm operating this under, under three, three questions or, or three you know, kind of grounding points. Uh, one of them, Let's, let's look at the origin. Uh, you know, how did baseball go to Cuba? How was it, does it spread to Cuba? And how does it become tied to Cuban national identity at that time? After that, how does Cuban baseball develop? Think of this as kind of the middle part uh, from Cuban independence, uh, the Cuban Republican period, up through, let's say, about the 1940s. Uh, it's, it's not necessarily the, the Cuban Revolution yet, but we're getting into that, that time frame. And then we'll pick up right around the Cuban Revolution going forward. So 1960s going forward. So three, three points, how, you know, the origin of baseball in Cuba and how it becomes tied to nas Cuban national identity, uh, how baseball in Cuba develops over time, and how does it change after the revolution. 
or does it change? You know, that, those sorts of questions. Um, all right. As we're doing this, you know, as, as we go forward through this, this time together, uh, I'm going to bring up a couple of myths. Uh, the, the first myth I'm going to bring up is, is the myth of the origin of baseball. That's probably familiar to most people. Uh, this is operating myth that Abner Doubleday in Cooperstown, New York, invented baseball. Uh, that's, that was really good marketing by Albert Spalding. Uh, in, in the turn of the century, Spalding had, had gone into business as, as a, a sporting good mogul, basically. And they, they tried to, you know, after the, the Spanish-American War, tried to capitalize on patriotism, of nationalism, rising national. The U.S. had just you know, won a war against Spain. Uh, had, had acquired some over, overseas territories. Uh, Spalding was going to capitalize on that and uh, did so by putting baseball as its origin as a, a, an American, quote unquote American, U.S. origin sport. Uh, baseball has a much longer history than that. Uh, it's, it's awfully similar to uh, an English game, something called Rounders, uh, that had been around for hundreds of years. Uh, a, a bat and ball type game that had bases. Uh, so I want to bring up or dispel this, this myth of the origin of baseball and how it enters into becoming the, the American pastime. Baseball's real origin happens before the Civil War, uh, around 1840s in New York City. Uh, one of the, the social clubs in New York City, uh, the, the New York uh, Knickerbocker Club, one of the members of that club, Alexander Cartwright, uh, Introduce, takes this game arounders, plays around with, with some of, of the rules and introduces it. And it becomes popular within the, the New York athletic club culture. All right, so I've spent all this time just talking about baseball and I haven't really talked about Cuba yet. Uh, so where, where does the Cuba story start, right? Uh, the Cuba story starts right about this time uh, in, in the 1860s uh, when baseball has, has been founded and becomes popularized in New York City and begins to diffuse nationally. Right, so, are we working? Next slide. I guess we're not doing that. Technical difficulties. All right, so in the 1860s, young men of the upper class in Cuba would typically go to the United States, go to Europe, there we go, uh, and you know, in some cases go to, to Mexico for higher education. Uh, so we're talking about young men who were peers of this class that is founding and popularizing baseball uh, in the United States. Uh, so these young men on college campuses come in contact with baseball and when they go home, they carry baseball with them. That's how baseball diffuses organically to Cuba. Uh, in 18, let's see, 1864, a couple of, of young Cubans, uh, one of them uh, in particular, uh, Nemeso Uido, or Uio, uh, is he, uh, goes to Spring Hill College in Mobile, Alabama, comes into contact with, with baseball when he returns to Cuba, begins to, you know, in Havana, form a baseball team, a baseball club that was amateur to begin with, but then turns professional. Uh, that baseball club was, was the Habana Baseball Club. Uh, it was kind of one of the foundational baseball clubs in Havana. And again, it's still kind of upper class at this point. Uh, a couple of other uh, Cuban young men who go to, to universities in, in the United States, one of which was uh, Teodoro Zalda, he and his brother attend Fordham University in New York City. Uh, and while he's at, at Fordham in, in New York, comes into contact with baseball in the 1870s, 1878 in particular, when he returns home, he and his brother and a group of friends started a rival baseball club to the Habana Baseball Club. Uh, so you have this, this organic spread of, you know, from, of baseball from North America to, to Cuba uh, through kind of upper class institutions and forming it. And those upper class institutions originally are going to be athletic clubs, but they're going to turn professional pretty, pretty quickly. Uh, and the, the name 
Liga Unirao, uh, the Baseball de la Isla de Cuba. It's not a, not a brief title, but basically the, the general baseball league of the island of Cuba is, is officially founded in 1878. Habana is part of this, Almendares, Zalda's team is, is another rival. So it sets up rival clubs in Havana. And there are other, other clubs that, that come in and out of, of playing in these, these first organized leagues in Cuba. Uh, in the 1870s and 1880s. All right, so what's going on at the same time as this? Uh, beginning in same year, 1878, there's the beginnings of one of several armed rebellions against the Spanish. Uh, this, this one lasts 10 years. It's called, well, logically, it's, it's the 10 years war. Uh, and it's mostly fought in the, on the eastern side of the island. Uh, and I'll go into more detail in our second hour talking about this. Um, but that is going on at the same time as the organization of baseball in Havana. Uh, and so the, there's growth in this. Uh, after this war or, or you know, from the 1870s through the 1890s, uh, after peace is, is declared, uh, well, eight, 1876 through, through 1878, that was the end of the war. I'm getting those confused. Let's reset. Uh, so this baseball league is forming at the end of the 10 years war. There we go. Uh, and after this, baseball spreads, penetrates basically every, every facet of, of Cuban society. It goes from the upper class to working class in Havana, their, their local leagues form. It's really similar to how baseball emerges in the United States. You know, after the Civil War, there's the spread of basically town ball. Uh, and it becomes a popular pastime by a lot of different uh, social and economic and even racial classes. Uh, there are some, some uh, black Cuban organizations in Havana that form their own teams and start to, to participate in baseball. So it's, it's diffusing socially you know, through, through uh, economic and, and social classes and also racially in Cuba during this time. And during this time, you know, is after this war, it's, it's not like after the, the Ten Years' War, uh, the push towards independence ends. Uh, it, it intensifies, and rhetoric intensifies. And baseball plays a role in that. Baseball becomes identified with a free Cuba, a, few, a Cuba that's not tied to the old world, but it's a part of the new world. The sport that was founded in the United States, in the Western Hemisphere, in the Americas, Cuba, Cubans, who play baseball are identifying with an identity separate from being a subject of Spain. Uh, and so there's, there's this, baseball becomes part of this, this early conception of, especially among the, the upper class and, and some, some of the intelligentsia, uh, baseball becomes tied to what it means to be Cuban, uh, separate from. So it's, again, you know, it's, it's separating Cuba from, from Europe to being associated with the Americas and then also, there's this view of, of baseball as a modern sport, uh, as you know, these, these Cubans exercising their agency, you know, adopting this modern sport and shunning sports like bullfighting. Uh, those, those Spanish pastimes, you know, there was a lot of arguments during this period, late 19th century, that uh, I mean, it continues to today, uh, that bullfighting was barbaric uh, and was, again, something of the old world that Cubans need to leave behind. And so baseball becomes a threat. Uh, baseball becomes a threat to the Spanish. Uh, in, in 1895, the year that the, the Cuban War of Independence begins, uh, you know, when Ho Jose Marti comes back to Cuba, uh, Spanish authorities ban baseball. They try to suppress baseball because even by that time, before Cuba was even independent, Baseball was associated with resistance to the Spanish and the Cubans uh, exerting their agency. Doesn't work. I mean, baseball continues, but a lot of, a lot of the, the organized leagues are put on pause. Uh, there, there are priorities here uh, of, uh, you know, let's, let's fight the war with Spain, not necessarily, we don't really have time for organized baseball. Uh, but, you know, that brings us to Spanish-American War, 1898. Uh, the United States intervenes into 
uh, the, this at the very end of the Cuban War of Independence. Uh, and you know, the, the country that originates baseball after 1898 plays a, a, a extremely influential role in the way Cuba develops after independence. And so there's an intensification of baseball culture uh, after, after independence in uh, 1898. Uh, there's, baseball becomes transnational. Uh, there's transnational ties. And there was already evidence of that, of Cuban exile communities in, say, Key West having teams. Uh, so there's, there's some evidence of, of transnational sport of baseball, U.S. and Cuba during uh, late 19th century, but it really intensifies in early 20th century. Now, one of the best books uh, on Cuban baseball was, was written by Ro Robert Gonzalez Echevarria. Uh, he, the, the title of it is uh, the, the, Pride of, uh, the Pride of Havana, and is, is a, a broad narrative history of uh, Cuban baseball. And the next period I want to talk about, you know, the development of Cuban baseball during the Republic and during their independence period, uh, and that's, that's even a contested subject, we'll, we'll probably get into that in the second hour, uh, is uh, this, this period that, that happens after 1902, extends into the 1930s, really even through the 1940s. So basically the, the first half of the 20th century. Uh, he calls this the, the golden age of Cuban baseball, where uh, you know, there's, uh, I mentioned the, the transnational sports culture, but you have Cuban baseball players go to Major League Baseball. Now I, I need to, to you know, put an asterisk here because there, there were a few examples of, of Cubans playing baseball in the first half of the 20th century, but they, they would be considered white because of the color line in baseball at this time. So there's the politics of whiteness play into this. And uh, so there's, there's examples that have uh, Adolfo Lu Luque is, is the one of the major figures uh, from the the mid 19 teens into the 1920s, he he pitches for the, the for several teams, but uh, rises rises to fame with with the Cincinnati Reds. Uh, and after his career in in Cuba, he goes back to Cuba and becomes a, a manager, and so gets in, gets tied into uh, the the Cuban League and the development of organized baseball in Cuba. So that's that's going on during this time. Um, I, I mentioned that. Uh, by the, the 1870s, 1890s, uh, baseball had, had you know, spread through Cuban society, uh, had crossed race lines. Uh, and so the, the, there were development of, of major you know, world-class um, black Cuban players who would go to the United States and play in the Negro Leagues uh, during this time. So there's, again, you know, this, this transnational of the best talent uh, going to the United States and uh, also some examples of, of U.S. teams traveling to Cuba and playing exhibition games. Uh, so there's, there's this, this sort of, uh, yeah, uh, this is sort of dual, simultaneous, concurrent baseball cultures developing uh, at the same time and really responding off of one another. Uh, and as I mentioned with, uh, I've spent the, pretty much the whole time, uh, the first hour I talked about this, uh, the, the baseball games played between the Cuban, Cuban teams and, and U.S. teams, especially in the Cuban press, uh, became uh, games or, or encounters where uh, it's, it's the Cuba versus the United States. And when Cuba would win, that, or the Cuban team would win, that would be a win for Cubans. Uh, and that, that has to do with, with the power dynamics between the United States and Cuba and, and perceptions of, of that relationship and using baseball as resistance to uh, the, the overwhelming influence of the United States during this period of Cuban history. So in, in this period, <clears throat> excuse me, all right, there's, there's the development of professional baseball, there's the development of semi-professional baseball in Cuba, there's the development of amateur baseball in Cuba, and then lastly, uh, there's, there's, and this, this is just as important as the others, there's the development of sugar mill baseball in Cuba as well. All right, so uh, let's, let's take a little bit of, of you know, going beyond professional. Uh, the semi-pro baseball, again, it, it's similar to the, the town ball that we saw 
across America. So you, it's really difficult for us to, to conceive this. I, I guess Joplin has a team, right, as a, a minor league baseball team. But pretty much every town uh, had across the United States had at least one team, if not more than one team. Same sort of thing happens in Cuba uh, of these kind of local rivalries. And we, we call it semi-professional because, yeah, they, they may be getting some money, but it's, it's basically splitting up whatever the gate receipts were. Uh, they're, they're doing this more, less, less to make money or, or to pursue it as a profession or as a career. But as a pastime, that could you know, give you a little extra income here or there. That was common throughout the island of Cuba in, in small and medium-sized towns. Uh, I know most of what I talk about centers on Havana because of its, its importance, uh, especially to, to the, the formation of, of um, the Cuban League and, and, and the, it's, it gets the overwhelming influence of Cuban history, probably disproportionately. Uh, but I, I want to bring up this, this semi-pro baseball that's, that's played island-wide. Uh, amateur baseball. Amateur baseball was played uh, among white, uh, you know, racially exclusive, upper-class institutions in Havana and in other cities. Uh, there's, I, I mentioned the Club Atletico de Cuba uh, as, as playing football during this time. There were several other teams with, within that athletic club culture that would also play baseball as well. And uh, it, during the 1930s, going into the 1940s, uh, especially during the Depression and you know, the end of the Depression and going into World War II, these athletic club teams had the most resources. And in, in a way, even though they were, quote unquote, amateur, got the best talent, uh, would, would be able to pull talent away from the, the professional teams, uh, you know, give them membership and probably pay for their expenses and that sort of stuff. Uh, and would compete in terms of crowds with, with uh, professional baseball, uh, the professional baseball teams at this time. And I want to, this, this part, I, I, I want to bring up sugar mill baseball. Sugar mill baseball is a lot like factory baseball in America. Working class, we don't really have time to go into the sugar economy and, and that sort of stuff, but uh, think of it in terms of, the majority of the people, you know, this, this was kind of rural baseball. Uh, the majority of the people working the sugar plantations or the sugar, well, I guess you can still call them plantations at this time, uh, were black Cubans. They were black Cubans of working class, working poor, limited economic and, and social mobility at this time. And uh, the companies who owned these, these sugar mills would introduce Baseball and a lot of other things, they're, they're, it's kind of like the factory towns of, of the United States uh, of you know, building a, uh, have their, their own convenience store uh, and, and their own movie theater and that sort of pr providing entertainment and, and uh, distractions uh, to the brutality of, of you know, their, their labor uh, and their limited uh, economic and social mobility. Baseball played a role in this. Uh, and a lot of uh, the prominent black Cuban baseball players will emerge from these sugar mill uh, teams because uh, the best players get noticed. The scouts will go out and sign the best talent. That's, that's another thing I need to bring up with, with Cuban baseball is that in contrast to organized baseball in the United States, uh, professional baseball in Cuba was integrated. Uh, they, there were both black and white players uh, for Cuban league teams um, during this time. All right, so I have a few other slides during this. Baseball parks began to be built and in increasingly increasing size. And the, the size and scale of these parks reflect the, the popularity of, of baseball, especially in Havana during this time. This, this is a, a look at uh, La, La Tropical uh, Stadium. It was, it was built, it was built by, with private, private money, uh, you know, private financing uh, by uh, this, this owner of a brewery. Uh, so he, he had the brewery, he, he built a dance hall, he built a, a, you know, basically a, a you know, botanical garden 
and he, he built an all-purpose baseball sports, sports park too. Uh, and a lot of the baseball, a lot of the, the professional baseball games in Cuba, uh, really uh, beginning in the 1930s, uh, are played at Lo Tropical, La Tropical uh, from 1930 through 1946. Uh, in 1946, this, this baseball stadium is, is supplanted by El Gran Stadium, uh, the, the major, I, got a, I have a slide of that uh, in a minute. All right, so we're going into, going into the 1920s, going into the 1930s. Uh, the, the 1920s saw the expansion of um, tourism into Cuba from the United States uh, because of prohibition. Uh, Cuba, I mean, you could go to Cuba and, and you know, have a drink legally uh, at that time. And Cuba, Cuban, you know, Cuban businesses, hotels, uh, kind of catered to U.S. Uh, uh, U.S. tourists at this time. You also, in, in the 1920s, began to, to have higher and higher profile U.S. teams go to Cuba. John McGraw's New York Giants in 1920 go to Cuba and play games against Habana and Almendares. Uh, and so you're, you're starting to have interactions between uh, these, these baseball teams that were prominent in the United States and prominent in Cuba. That same year, 1920, it's the year Babe Ruth starts to you know, blossom with the New York Yankees. He travels to, to Havana and goes on, a, uh, he's not necessarily doing uh, baseball exhibitions, but goes on, on a, a promotional tour. Uh, and it, you could already see his celebrity in Cuba, you know, drawing crowds. Oops. All right, so La Tropical, going into the 1940s. Now I mentioned El Gran Stadium. It's completed and uh, opens in 1946, after World War II. El Gran Stadium looks an awful lot like a Major League Baseball park. Uh, it, it held at this time in the neighborhood of 30,000 uh, spectators. And in 1946, the Cuban League uh, that, that consisted of four teams in Havana, well, Havana adjacent, uh, moved to their regular season to uh, El Gran Stadium. And I have, I have a slide here with, to, to go into a little bit more detail. That same year, the Brooklyn Dodgers hold spring training in, in Havana. Ninth, well, 1947, uh, the, the spring of 1947, uh, same year that Jackie Robinson integrates Major League Baseball. The Dodgers hold their spring training games at El Gran Stadium in Havana. Uh, and in effect, uh, the Dodgers are responding to what happened in 1946 in Florida, uh, going to, to Cuba to, to a place where there were already integrated teams. Uh, so they're, they're easing the transition into uh, the, the 47 season with Jackie Robinson. And as you can see here, this, this is a photo from the dugout at El Gran Stadium. It kind of shows you how you know, the fame of Jackie Robinson and, and how uh, baseball was, a, you know, the popularity of baseball was transnational um, by this time. So here's, here's my Cuba League slide. Uh, from 1946 to basically the, the Cuban Revolution, uh, the Cuba League had a, a period of relative stability. Playing games at El Gran Stadium, there were four teams, uh, Habana, Almendares, Cienfuegos. Cienfuegos was in another town. Uh, and uh, Mariano. Uh, Mariano, oh, uh, it, they were kind of a, a suburb of, of Havana. Uh, so you, you have uh, these teams, and again, I, I, I bring this up because it shows the, uh, how Cuban baseball entered into the, the, the visual and um, material culture of, of uh, Cuba during this time. Uh, with, you know, there, if, if you look at, at eBay, uh, you, you can probably buy pins uh, for, for these, these Cuban baseball teams, you know, these kind of collectibles. Uh, it's baseball in Cuba had, had developed to that sort. So it's, it's really a, 
similar to what we see in the United States. It's kind of parallel culture. What's going on during this time as well, especially 1950s going into the 1960s? Fulgencio Batista returns to Cuba in 52 and establishes a, a military dictatorship, basically. Um, you know, he, he suspends the constitution and suspends elections. So I guess that's a dictatorship, right? Uh, and the beginnings of the, the Cuban Revolution. And so during this, during basically this, this period of stability in baseball in Havana, the Cuban Revolution's playing out. Uh, there are instances in, in the mid-1950s where student activists uh, you know, that were participating within the, the Cuban Revolution would hold protests at El Brown Stadium because they would get attention with that. They would draw attention. Uh, so there's, there's, there's this, this, this changing that's, that's occurring, this, this challenging of what it meant to be Cuban, uh, of you know, the, the order at that time, and then this, this revolutionary move. Uh, and I think I got ahead of myself again. Uh, you know, during this time, especially late, late 50s, uh, there's, there's another move of Cubans trying to enter into broader organized baseball of, of a Havana-based team. Uh, there, were, there was a, a team that, that was before this, the Havana Cubans, but the, the Havana Sugar Kings entered, entered into the International League in, in uh, the late 1950s. The, the International League was the same league as uh, the Montreal Royals, team that, that was tied to uh, the, the Brooklyn Dodgers, the, the team that Jackie Robinson integrates that league before he integrates Major League Baseball. Uh, so there's, there are efforts made to bring Cuba, Cuban baseball and Cuban teams into broader Major League Baseball. Now, as I was talking about, uh, as I got ahead of myself uh, with, uh, with uh, the Cuban Revolution, uh, sidetracks uh, this effort in, in many ways. Uh, in 1959, Fulgencio Batista resigns, leaves the island January 1st, 1959. Uh, you have the, the overturn of the, the established order, but you don't have the overthrow of baseball. Uh, you know, there's baseball, the baseball season in 1959 was disrupted, but only disrupted for about five days. Uh, so there was not a whole lot of disruption in 59. In fact, uh, you know, Fidel Castro and this, this new government embraced baseball because, again, it's tied to what it means to be Cuban. But what it means to be Cuban changed. So it, the, the meaning changes, but they're, they're keeping baseball as tied to, you know, this is social and, and cultural, culturally important uh, part of being Cuban. Now, I mentioned myths at the beginning, and I, I led off with the myth of uh, Abner Doubleday. There, there are two myths surrounding Fidel Castro and, and Cuban baseball. Uh, the first one was that uh, Fidel Castro was a star pitcher who had a, a major league tryout, and if he was signed to the Yankees, there wouldn't have been a Cuban revolution. Uh, all right, so that, that's a myth. Uh, there, there was, it's, it's, it's based off of, really shoddy scholarship. Uh, they, they, they pick up some elements of truth with this uh, of, you know, because when, when Castro was, was in college, yeah, he was an athlete. He played on the intramural team at, at the University of Havana. He played for the, the basically what, what amounts to the, uh, the, the law school's team. Uh, but he was, he was an even better basketball player. Nobody really even knows that. Uh, in fact, Castro would go on you know, hours and hours and hours talking about how basketball was the revolutionary sport because uh, it, it, it encouraged innovation. And I, we won't go into that. We don't have time. Um, but yeah, he, he embraced baseball, uh, but he was never a, a, a major league prospect. He showed up at, at a, a, what amounted to a, a, a large tryout one time in 1946 uh, and was never approached. 
uh, for it. So yeah, the kernel of truth is, yeah, he did show up to a tryout, but hundreds of other people showed up to that tryout and he was not selected. Uh, so there's, there's no you know, alternate history where he, he pitches for the, the Washington senators or something like that instead of ha you know, leading the, the Cuban revolution. So that's one myth. Uh, the, the second myth is Fidel Castro ruined Cuban baseball. Uh, that he destroyed Cuban baseball. And like I said before, he embraced baseball. The Cuban revolution and you know, the, the revolutionary government embraced baseball because it was so important to what it meant to be Cuban, what it meant to be a free Cuban. It had ties back to the, the original independence movement. So he doesn't change it in that way. He just, the definition of what they considered Cuban identity changes. And baseball is a part of that. In fact, I, again, we're, we're running a little short on time and I wish I had more time to go into this, but uh, 1959, the Cuban League season played out. Uh, with, with, you know, there was a brief inter interruption, but um, it continued as, as scheduled, finished out. Uh, the, the Havana Sugar Kings, played out their season in the International League. Now, things kind of get called into question late 59 into 1960, whether or not there's going to be continued play of the Cuban League or uh, the, uh, the Sugar Kings. Uh, there are moves made from the U.S. perspective, um, moves that are made especially in the 1960s where Major League Baseball's commissioner he didn't, he didn't ban U.S. players, but strongly encouraged U.S. players not to play in the Cuban League. Uh, and a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the justification behind that was it's too dangerous. There's this, this revolutionary government, there's revolution going on. It's too dangerous for you to go down there. You're, you're too valuable to your Major League Baseball team to risk yourself in Cuba at this time. Uh, so that was the justification, but it also kind of creates a... a a blacklist of the best players playing in the Cuban League because Cuban players, Cuban Major League Baseball players in the 1950s had to make a choice. Are they going to play in Major League Baseball or are they going to play in the Cuban League? And the majority of them stayed in the United States. And so that's, that's part of, of what's going on. Uh, there are moves made by the, the International League, the, the league that the, the Sugar Kings were a part of, that in effect, uh, called into question having games in Havana, called into question the finances of the Sugar Kings, and yeah, they, they were, their budget was tight, uh, tight to the point to where there was questions of whether or not they would even be able to fill the team that year. Uh, the Cuban government, uh, at this time Che Guevara was the, the director of finance, uh, he personally assured that the, the, if the Sugar Kings couldn't pay their, their expenses, the Cuban government would, would pay their expenses. But at this time, that was not, that was not uh, an attractive alternative uh, for the International League. And uh, what, what happened with that? Long story short, uh, the, the franchise is bought or changes hands. The Sugar King franchise moves to uh, Jersey City, New Jersey, uh, and begins to play in, uh, doesn't end operation, but begins to play there. Uh, and so Havana loses their tie to organized baseball after the revolution. I spent a good bit of time in our first hour, well, that's not, uh, talking about, I thought I had another slide. Uh, what happens in 61? The re reorganization of Cuban sports, uh, the introduction of a, a, a governmental ministry of sport basically uh, and the, the, the complete reorganization. And what happens with baseball during this time? There's, there's an end to professional baseball in Cuba. Everything's reorganized into amateur baseball, uh, an amateur organization. And uh, there's a superstructure put in, in place to gear the training of baseball players towards international competitions. Uh, and in doing that, uh, there's the introduction of, or the, the spread, of uh, baseball academies, you know, get, get young kids in, prospects, and there was a lot of, there was a lot of um, you know, kind of science involved in that, uh, of 
uh, you know, judging genetics and judging you know, yeah, abilities at a young age uh, to, to see who's going to be in, in those academies. Uh, and they're, in, in effect, you know, train and, and get the best baseball players out of Cuba. Uh, and there's, there's also a league that's founded in 1961 uh, called the National Series. It takes the place of the Cuban League. Uh, again, you know, these are amateur teams, uh, and the majority of them are in Havana early on. Um, but they're, it, it takes the place of uh, professional baseball. These, these um, Cuban baseball players would play in that National Series and you know, kind of hone their skills there. And the popularity of that series or the expansion of that series, you know, originally it was four teams. Uh, following year, they added two, two more teams. And then uh, within a few years, it expanded to 14 teams. And they reorganized the whole thing to where pretty much every region in, in Cuba, on the island of Cuba, has a team. And so this national series becomes kind of a national championship type organization uh, with Havana, uh, Havana having the, the lion's share of the teams and the best teams overall. Um, there's, I'll, I'll bring this up in closing because I know I'm, I'm going on a little bit longer than I had planned. This is a huge topic and I'm doing my best. Uh, but um, there's, there's a, an effort during this time, during the, the 1960s, 1970s, of having ties back to the, past, the Cuban baseball past. There's the introduction of uh, a, a team in the National Series called the Industriales. Uh, they, uh, they wore blue, and the, the, the player or the, the fans who traditionally supported Almendares, uh, the, one of those ancient teams uh, that was consistent within Cuban baseball, their, their fandom migrated towards Industriales. Uh, then there was a, a metropol metropolitan team that was founded uh, that, that in effect was the foil of, of uh, the industriales and they wore red and they were basically Habana. Uh, so you have a, a recreation, kind of a, a through the looking glass, uh, alternate universe version of uh, Cuban baseball that emerges during this time. And I'll, I'll end on this slide. We'll, we'll go into more detail. Well, it's in my hand. Uh, I'll end on this slide because from the 1990s going through basically 2016, uh, there was increasing contact between the United States and Cuba in terms of baseball. There were a lot of, of uh, Major League Baseball exhibitions, you know, kind of goodwill um, exhibition games played in Havana during this time. And uh, even uh, Barack Obama, President Obama, goes to a Cuban baseball game in his visit in 2016. Uh, and as of a couple of years ago, Major League Baseball was negotiating with the, the Cuban government to uh, make, make a deal for the easier transfer of, of Cuban players to the United States, but all of that's been put on hold. Um, there's, and that, we'll, we'll go into some, some of that in a little bit. So, all right, questions. Questions before I go through this entire hour. If you have a question, let me bring you the microphone. We have about five minutes left for questions. Nick, I'd be more than happy to answer questions later on too, if you have so, baseball related questions. What, what is the current status of Cuban players playing major league baseball? Are they allowed to? They used to have to, you know, leave Cuba illegally. What's the status today? I would have to look it up. Uh, the, the agreement that was put into place or that was being negotiated was to allow for the easy transfer of, of Cuban players to Major League Baseball and back. So in, in effect, make it to where they don't have to defect to play Major League Baseball. Uh, but that's been put on hold um, for a lot of reasons. Uh, but yeah, beforehand, Cuban baseball players from 61 through the 90s, well, through to the present, you have to defect. And there's, there's an increase in defections after 1990 uh, with the special period because of uh, the, the economic situation in Cuba. Yes, sir. Peering into the future, when do you think, or will it happen, 
will there be a major league baseball team in Cuba, either in the National or the American League? Oh, I'm a historian. I look backwards. <laughs> I don't have a crystal ball. Uh, but apparently there's an ownership group who bought the rights to the Sugar Kings, uh, the Sugar Kings that moved to Jersey City, New Jersey. And there's, again, this, this, is, this is probably wishful thinking on their part, um, but there's this belief that buying that means they own the rights to a, a major league baseball or organized baseball team in Havana. So if relations were to normalize, if agreements could be made, then maybe. But there's a lot of ifs and maybes in that, that statement. Uh, so there's, there's, there's this dream of the Sugar Kings, this dream of Major League Baseball being in, in Havana and basically coming close to it, or at least on that track after World War II. But the Cuban Revolution happens and things change. Uh, and uh, I don't know. We'll have to see. Uh, a lot of things will have to fall into place. But that was, that was, that was the ambition. Bobby Maduro, the, the owner of the Sugar Kings, his ambition was to have a Major League Baseball team in Havana uh, because you know, having it in Havana is, is just like having it in Miami, right? Why do you think, <clears throat> excuse me, why do you think baseball became uh, a big thing in Cuba originally? What do you think drew them to that particular sport over something else? Okay, so why baseball? You know, why not soccer, right? Um, and it, it gets back to you know, pr pretty much all of the scholarship points to baseball being associated with the Americas. Uh, baseball being associated with modernity. Uh, baseball being this modern sport uh, that's, that's not looking back to Europe, that's looking forward. Uh, and those in the Cuban independence movement wanting to move in that direction, wanting to be associated with that. that I mentioned bullfighting, but uh, soccer or you know, football was popular or, or was a sport. And th there was an effort in the 1930s for soccer to be uh, you know, popularized in Havana. There was a real push for that. Uh, La Tropical uh, basically was the, the home of that league. Uh, but it never takes off. Uh, and it, it doesn't take off for a lot of reasons. Uh, but there's, in the, in the late 1930s, there's, there's some immigration from Spain after the Spanish Civil War. Uh, those who immigrate to Cuba typically were on the left side of the political spectrum. And so part of that project gets sidelined because of politics, internal politics in Cuba. Of, okay, there's a, there's a rise in anti-Spanish sentiment in, in Cuba during that time, and it translates to being anti-soccer, or, or at the very least, preventing soccer from b becoming popularized. But it, there, there's been an effort in the last couple of years of, of soccer, because, I mean, Soccer is an international sport, most popular sport in the world, has very low entry costs. Basically, you need a ball. That's it. Um, but again, you know, this, this looking at this, the Cuban tie to baseball was, was the tie that, that this, this why it becomes popular in the United States. Same, same situation. But there's, there's this, this independence. This, this, we're different than Spain portion of it as well. Okay, we're out of time. Uh, let's give Michael Wood one more round of applause for speaking today. I hope that made sense. So we'll, me, uh, we'll give you a 10 minute break before your next presentation. Good. I'll catch my breath. If anybody has any questions, feel free to ask now too.